This would be FDR's last opportunity to influence the direction of post-war Europe. Roosevelt's fourth inaugural was held at the White House instead of the Capitol. It was a break with tradition necessitated because FDR was no longer strong enough to walk the 37 steps down the face of the Capitol to get to the podium. Before the ceremony, he asked his son Jimmy to join him in his study. He had a premonition that he wasn't going to last long, and Roosevelt talked about his will, but he also took off his gold family crest wing that his father had given him, and he gave it to his eldest son. And James said when he left, he felt that he, he would never see his father alive again. And he never did. It was one of the shortest inaugural addresses ever given, just 573 words. Its length dictated by estimating the time he could stand without collapsing. In the days and the years that are to come, we shall work for a just and honorable peace, a durable peace, as today we work and fight for total victory in war. On January 22nd, 1945, Roosevelt left on the battleship USS Quincy for the 10-day trip to Yalta. For the first time, FDR took his Secretary of State to a wartime conference. By now, it was Edward Stettinius, a man whose fortunes had risen by virtue of his unwavering loyalty to Roosevelt. Cordell Hull had resigned two months earlier, telling his staff he was tired of White House intrigue, tired of being bypassed, tired of being relied on in public and ignored in private. What lay ahead was the longest, most hazardous journey of Roosevelt's life. He was given immense briefing books to read about all the different issues that were going to be discussed. He just completely ignored them. On the ship going over, he just sat staring out at the space. You know, he was, he was practically incapable of, of uh, any kind of thought. Hugh Lungie was part of the British delegation sent out to Yalta to prepare for the conference. He met Roosevelt when his plane landed at Saki Airfield. Well, the first shock was seeing him at the airport and seeing him look, look this color. And there was Roosevelt looking absolutely terrible, like uh, a waxen figure, and not enjoying it at all, I don't think, because it was cold uh, and windy on this snow-covered airfield. Much has been made of the president's diminished capacity at Yalta, that the unsatisfactory outcome was driven by his illness. Churchill was very shocked by Roosevelt's his hesitations, his, his rambling. And when they were sitting with Stalin at Yalta, again and again, Churchill presented one of the Anglo-American points of view uh, and then would turn to Roosevelt for confirmation, for Roosevelt to put in, as it were, his confirming point of view that it sometimes seemed Roosevelt hadn't really even been following the discussion between Churchill and Stalin. Certainly, the American president did acquiesce to Soviet demands that they be allowed control over Eastern Europe, although Roosevelt had already signaled that position at Tehran. He also gave in to Stalin's demands for veto power in what was to become the United Nations. So he made concession after concession to Stalin which appalled a lot of his advisors, particularly on the issue of Poland. Basically, he said to Stalin, it's yours, just make it, paper it over, make it look good. Winston Churchill, for all his reservations, became a party to the deal. He could have walked out and did not. Despite his long-standing mistrust of the Bolsheviks, the Prime Minister joined Roosevelt in declaring Yalta as an historic step forward. It's important to remember that Roosevelt was not duped by Stalin. Churchill was not absolutely right about Stalin. They, these were men who were in the arena, who were trying as hard as they could, confronted by the most tangled problems that had ever confronted statesmen in the history of the world, the dawn of the atomic age, the remaking of the entire globe. And they were simply doing the best they could. Roosevelt told Eleanor that he felt he had no choice but to trust the Soviet leader. He looked at me and he said, there was one all-important thing. We haven't yet won the war in the Pacific. It may cost us thousands and thousands of American lives to finally conquer Japan. I had to think 
of the most important thing, which was to get the Soviet force, military force, as soon as possible into the Pacific to save American lives. On March 1st, 1945, an exhausted president reported to a joint session of Congress about the Yalta Conference. After all he'd been through over the past 12 years, he was finally prepared to make concessions to his disability. I hope that you will pardon me for an unusual posture of sitting down during the presentation of what I want to say. I know that you will realize that it makes it a lot easier for me in not having to carry about 10 pounds of steel round on the bottom of my legs, and also because of the fact that I have just completed a 14,000 mile trip. FDR told his daughter Anna that his headaches were intensifying, and he was often debilitated with pain. But Dr. McIntyre insisted that all Roosevelt needed was time in the Georgia hills to gather his strength. Among those who joined FDR in Georgia were his cousin Daisy Sukley, and by arrangement with Anna, his forbidden love, Lucy Rutherford. His worsening condition was obvious. On April 11th, they went to his favorite scenic spot, Dowdell's Knob, to look over the Pine Mountain Valley. It was spring in Georgia, and there was rebirth in the air. Far away, American soldiers crossed the Rhine. The Marines had landed on Iwo Jima and Okinawa. That evening, he was back at the Little White House, his home at Warm Springs, complaining of acute head pains and running a low-grade fever. April 11th, 1945. When Franklin was ready for the night, I got his gruel and took it to him. He lay on his back and began to pull the covers up to his chin, shivering and saying he is cold. He is too weak to raise his head, so I proceed to feed him with a teaspoon, and he loves it. He talked about his part in world peace. He then relapsed into babyhood for the rest of the gruel. I kissed him goodnight and left. April 12th, 1945, FDR awoke, seemingly refreshed. Elizabeth Shumatov, a Russian artist, arrived to work on a portrait of Roosevelt. At noon, Madame Shumatov remarked that he seemed so much better today. Roosevelt replied that he was getting tired and needed a break. In a rare voice recording, Daisy Sukley picks up the story. I was sitting on the sofa, crocheting. Mrs. Charlotte had sat quietly near the window. I glanced up from my work and saw the person apparently looking for something. I went up to him and stooping looked up into his face and asked him, have you dropped your cigarette? He looked at me as far as furrowed with pain and tried to smile. He put his left hand up to the back of his head and he said, I have a terrific pain in the back of my head. With that, he collapsed on the floor and was carried a dead weight into his bedroom. Dr. Bruin, who had first diagnosed his congestive heart failure a year earlier, arrived but could do nothing. For two and a half hours, FDR clung on to life as Daisy sat outside his door, listening. A little after three, the president's breathing became very heavy and labored. At that moment, the heavy breathing stopped. I looked at my watch. It was 25 minutes before. Eleanor was in Washington when she was informed of her husband's death. When she arrived at Warm Springs near midnight, she was devastated to learn that Lucy Mercer Rutherford had been with Franklin on the day he died and that her daughter Anna arranged the trip. The next day, FDR's body left Warm Springs for the final time. Alone for the long train ride to Washington, Eleanor watched as thousands upon thousands lined the railroad tracks to pay their respects. It was the beginning of a personal reassessment. 